Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 17, Advocating for the Mexican Gray Wolf, featuring Amy Harwood. On June 2nd, 2020, I interviewed Amy Harwood of Lobos of the Southwest about her organization's advocacy for the Mexican Gray Wolf and particularly for its reintroduction into the wild. Lobos of the Southwest is a joint outreach and education initiative of several different environmental organizations and individuals who live in the Southwest United States. In our conversation, Amy and I talked about how the Mexican gray wolf nearly went extinct, breeding and reintroduction efforts, including cross-fostering of puppies, the challenges of working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Agency, cultural challenges, how 2020 was a rough year for the wolf, and the joys of public advocacy, especially working with young people. Lobos of the Southwest is doing great work and is an organization well worth supporting. Please see show notes for links to see how you can help. My name is Amy Harwood, and I currently am the coordinator for Lobos of the Southwest, which is a joint outreach and education initiative of several different environmental organizations and individuals who live in the Southwest United States. And the idea is to be working collectively to elevate the advocacy of Mexican gray wolves um, in the effort to recover them. And also to kind of elevate the the idea that wolves belong here because of um, the reality that they were removed so fully from this area. There's an interest to make sure that we're we're thinking also, you know, as as along with our legal tools and angles, and along with uh, political pressure, also just doing a lot of basic outreach and education about wolves in the area um, so that hopefully by the next generation, it's, it's more of a, um, uh, an accepted thing that wolves exist in the Southwest United States. And I've worked in environmental organizing for a long time and have been spending time in Arizona for a number of years and took on this role a couple years, uh, almost two years ago now. Um, I've been a longtime fan of wolves and like a lot of advocates, um, find myself constantly kind of getting pulled back to the species because they are just so remarkable. And and also, I think politically, it's a very it's a very compelling uh, species to work on for a number of reasons. They really have a pretty compelling parallel to a lot of other points in our social evolution as a as the United States and as uh, the Southwest and um, and you can you can really see how it when something happens around acceptance or rejection of wolves in the wild it's often pretty tied to a lot of other social things that are evolving or happening and so I, I just think in terms of species and wildlife protection um, wolves particularly have uh, always ha- bring just a very important story, um, and and I think that's that's pretty old uh, for humans. I don't think that's like necessarily a new political evolution. We've been evolving with wolves for thousands and thousands of years, and I I think um, our our history is so tied to the that species that I find it really interest it's it's compelling to work on. So it's been a real exciting thing to get some time to really focus on that after years of wolves just being something I, I kind of paid attention to, but had never done a lot of campaign work around. So, yeah. Use this word lobos. I hadn't heard this one um, until I started looking into your group. Thank you. Yeah. So 
Um, Mexican gray wolves are a subspecies of gray wolves. Um, and lobos is the Spanish word for wolves. In Mexico, when you use the word lobos, you're likely referring to Mexican gray wolves, the subspecies. And so in the Southwest United States, people often refer to lobos and also are referring more to that subspecies than just wolves in general. Um, and we, and we also use it as, um, we, we do try to use the word Mexican gray wolves because it's important to establish that they are a subspecies of gray wolves, both, both just scientifically it's accurate, but also, um, there's political reasons why that's important to establish, but it's a, it's kind of a mouthful to have three, three words like that. So a lot of the times we, um, yeah, we just nickname Lobos. And so the, the history of this creature is that it was very widespread in the Southwest at one time. And then, of course, with the entry of Europeans and I would presume primarily ranching, the numbers of wolves went down because they were hunted. Yeah, that's right. And it actually, one of the things that's compelling to me also about wolves is there was like a continuous wolf presence in North America down even into Central America. And so you had different species of wolves evolving throughout the North America and wolves are worldwide, but particularly in this corridor from Northern Canada and down into Mexico and the Mexican gray wolf was an evolved subspecies of that, but it was also contiguous with these other wolf species. And now we mostly have northern gray wolves and then Mexican gray wolves. There are red wolves in the southeast, only a couple left. And it's the interest of advocates to be bringing these populations back in such abundance that they will eventually start to spread out again throughout that continuous evolved wolf presence. Yeah. But yeah, that's right. It, it is. And, and it, I would say it's it's sort of more than even just your basic colonization story or um, even more than ranching having an impact on the species. It was actually like a very explicit policy to remove wolves. So it, there was actually bounty hunters out and and people who were paid to go out and kill wolves. So, you know, as opposed to a lot of other species that maybe it was almost like a um, consequence of some of that activity with wolves. It really was like a very specific um, uh, effort to, to kill them off. And, and with Mexican gray wolves, they, they basically were extinct. They were, they were gone from the landscape. There was a few left in Mexico. Um, and the species that is being recovered now is actually originally from um, a couple of pairs of wolves that were removed from the wild down um, in Mexico and brought up to the United States to be bred. And um, and the, the genetics start there for most wolves that are in the wild now. And that was a very small number of animals, wasn't it? I think I read something about how they brought up uh, four males and one female from Mexico to start this program. Yeah, they started with seven and uh, lost a couple. And then, yes, it was a very small number. Um, a lot of the times that is that can work. There was wolves in captivity, like in zoos. And so there was the potential to be mixing some of these genetics as time went on. And there was actually a plan for that smaller species or that smaller group to be the kind of foundation to be the beginning and then to grow out from there and unfortunately the agency um the first wolves were released into the wild in 1998 and the plan was from there to be continuing to release wolves with other genetic material in in them um and that and that didn't happen and in fact it happened so slowly that it, it started to become a pretty serious problem um and there was a real moment in the recovery effort about 10 or 15 years ago where it, it seemed pretty touch, touch and go. And then um, there was some wolves released in 2006. Um, and then they, they started doing a program cro called cross fostering. And so there has been efforts to bring wolves out, um, but they haven't actually released a well bonded pair with pups, which is the ideal uh, way you want to release wolves from captivity into the wild. 
and I can talk about that. Um, but for since 2006, the only wolves that have been released have been these puppies um, in this process called cross fostering, which kind of comes out of um, a practice in um, sort of in farming and husbandry where you take the babies and basically move them into a different mother to be able to keep the genetics healthy of, of the species. Um, it's not one that's commonly used in wildlife recovery, but it works more or less with uh, wolves because of the denning process that happens. So basically you have wolves bred, um, born into captivity and the timing has to be just right, but they are brought by plane because most of these facilities are pretty far away. They're spread all over the country. They're flown into an area where they know that there's an active den. And then the oftentimes there's somebody from the facility that comes with the pups. They meet up with the agency scientists and they go out and they place those pups into those dens. There's usually a process of making sure that all the puppies smell the same or they do, they do, do certain techniques. Um, while the mother is away from the den and the idea is that when the mother returns, she's just sort of like, Oh, I forgot I had that one too. And then just start <laughs> raising them up as all, um, her own pups. And then that, that pup from the captivity becomes part of the pack, but with a much more diverse genetic material that will hopefully infiltrate into that pack. Um, wolves, have about a 50% mortality rate when they're born. Um, and then on top of that, there's obviously a lot that can go wrong in the process of bringing the pups out. So it's a, it's a pretty sh difficult thing to pull off. Um, and we've had some pretty big concerns that, that the agency is able to kind of count these puppies. You know, they did, I think we, uh, they did 22 last year and they did about 20, I think this year, um, and they're able to count that as, as, you know, it sounds like a lot of new wolves out onto the landscape that they're able to bring into the packs. The problem is a lot of them die or there's problems, you know, in, in the process of them growing up to be juveniles. And so we're, we're cautious to be critical because honestly, it's such an impressive feat of the breeding facilities to be able to even pull that off. And, then, um, and it's, it's a good idea to have that and releasing actual adult pairs that could be breeding out into the wild. Um, but we do have some concern that they're leaning on that too much because it's more socially palatable than releasing some wolves that have been hanging out in captivity um, and maybe have an appetite for the human luxuries. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, so anyway, that's kind of a long way of describing but that's that's what's up right now for us. Um, we're in, we just got through the cross fostering season, and we're all just hoping that those puppies, you know, do well in their new their new families. Right. So besides cross fostering, and besides introducing uh, adult pairs, uh, what are other things that are done to try to help the population recover? Well, I mean, right now, honestly, the agency's doing a whole lot of uh, interrupting the possibility of them recovering. So the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, a federal agency, is responsible for the recovery of the Mexican gray wolves. They are the agency that's responsible for um, overseeing the response to the Endangered Species Act. So when a species gets listed, that's the agency that makes sure they are that species is recovered. Mexican gray wolves are a little special because when an animal has basically gone to extinction, they use this thing called the 10J rule, which basically just says the agency needs to have a little more flexibility when they're dealing with bringing an extinct species back or they're bringing a species back to the wild from captivity because it's it's going to be it's a different process than just supporting the the population that's already out there. Um, and so sometimes that can be good flexibility but right now it feels like that that that's flexibility that is not necessarily in the best interest of the future of Mexican gray wolf recovery um so one of the things that we're really advocating for is um the uh, right now 
Mexican gray wolves are not when they when they cross the I forty boundary, which is a highway up um, in northern Arizona and New Mexico, it goes east west across across those states. When it crosses north of there, it's a real um, they they quickly remove the wolves from the wild and put them either into captivity or they move them back south. And that boundary is a very false boundary. It's a political boundary. It's basically just one that they encourage to make sure that wolves are not seen as just spreading out all over the place. Um, And so we're really advocating to make sure that that northern boundary is not honored the way it has been being used um, in such an unscientific way. And one of the reasons why we're focused on that boundary as opposed to some of the others, because, you know, the southern boundary is the, Mexi- is the uh, Mexico-U.S. border wall, and we can talk about that as well. Um, unfortunately, that feels politically more difficult to remove right now um, than potentially raising this northern boundary up. Um, I think also from a climate change perspective, it just makes more sense to be focused on making sure that these animals can move north. Um, but it's interesting right now, the Colorado state of Colorado is, has a ballot initiative to begin a wolf recovery pro- program. Um, and it looks very likely that it may do well um, in November, which is really exciting because what that would mean is that you'd have Colorado looking for opportunities in the state to release populations of wolves. And that may be a very good thing for Mexican gray wolves. If you had another area, uh, say in southwestern Colorado, where there was wolves getting released, whether those were Mexican gray wolves or northern gray wolves, you know, either way, that helps do that thing that I was just referring to in terms of con- making a continuous wolf presence um, that where the genetics are sort of moving throughout those species. Um, it's not always clear if that would happen, that those that the subspecies would um, would partner with the, the the gray wolf. They're they're quite a bit different. I mean, their size, for one thing, is a big big uh, impediment to that. But I think it's certainly possible. And also, it's very possible that Colorado would just say, you know what, we're just going to put Mexican gray wolves in southwestern Colorado, and that will be one of our wolf species. We don't know. They they, they didn't write that into the law, um, and that's not what voters are necessarily voting on. But I, I think what it does is basically open up area to the north that feels socially tolerant to, um, to wolves being introduced. So that would help a lot to have that area um, expanded that we could be seeing more wolves be introduced. Um, yeah, and I, I think really what's driving us right now in terms of the groups that I work with is making sure that anything we do is in service of just the genetics changing because right now they're in the species is basically in free fall um, genetically, even though the population is growing, which is great, um, but it but genetically it's it's doing worse and. Um, and so our anything that we're advocating for is really ultimately in service of making sure that the genetics of the species gets better. Because it's not just about numbers. It's about the genetics of it. Yeah, because e- even if you had if all of the population is basically more or less related, you just start to have that inbreeding. And, you know, I think inbreeding is something that exists in the natural world much more than <laughs> humans may be comfortable, you know, like thinking through on a, like for, for ourselves. Uh, But we know that there's a point where species start to have different behavior or, or are not as successful at their natural hunting and um, tendencies. Basically it starts to impact the way the, the species survives. Um, And we're not there yet, but that's what would happen. And so we're trying to avoid that from that that happening with the wild population. Right. I'd, I'd heard about the initiative in Colorado, and what I'd seen was that the numbers there looked good for passage and that the majority of voters were in favor of the initiative, including the majority of rural voters. So mm-hmm. that's that's exciting. And it, it seems like listening to you and, and also the reading I've done here that you've got you've got some different factors that you have to work with here that make things complicated. So on one hand, you've got just the science of it. And, you know, here's the, the, the ecology of it. 
and the needs all just from that point of view. Then you've got the politics and then you've got the cultural elements, you know, and so obviously they're all related and obviously the cultural elements can affect the politics. But it, it seems like, wow, you've got to be juggling here to when you're dealing with this issue, eh? Mm hmm. Yeah. And, you know, it's always a little frustrating in some ways, too, because like we we did some polling last year in Arizona and New Mexico and even in the rural areas in Arizona, and New Mexico, the majority of people support wolf recovery and wolf reintroduction. I mean, it's it's it, even in these sort of conservative pockets, you still have a majority uh, support. Um, but I think when um, people hear, you know, the cowboy, the cowboy myth is still a big, a big presence around here. And I think there's a lot of pride with, with that, uh, social association and cultural association. And frankly, like that's a big block for wolf recovery. Um, when you have Mexican gray wolves, mostly on public land, and then you are using that public land for grazing leases as well. And those are cattle that are not, that are sort of spread out over a large area and not often being tended. They may have a range rider coming by, you know, as they, as they can, but not just in a area where they're, they're being watched. Um, it's much harder to keep wolves from going, going for that easy food. Um, wolves generally do hunt and they, they go out into, you know, they're looking for elk, they're looking to chase things down. Um, but if there's a bunch of cows just sitting there, they're probably going to go for those too. And so I think you have a real conflict of interest in some of that public land area, um, which is where they're really focusing Mexican gray wolf recovery. There is some, there is a program on the White Mountain Apache reservation um, where, where they, they also have released some wolves <clears throat> and then occasionally wolves do wander onto the San Carlos Apache reservation and up into the Navajo. Um, that's, that's another area where people are, I, I, I don't believe there's any wolves up there now, but it's likely they will want to move that way, particularly if Colorado opens up. Um, and then Grand Canyon is also, there's a lot of area around the Grand Canyon, um, private and public even in the national park, that would be ideal for wolves to move. So for the most part right now, they're focused in uh, national forest land in the Gila and the Apache Seagraves uh, National Forest. But the reality is that it's they're, they're kind of on top of some of those grazing allotments and they really need to be able to move beyond there. Um, and so we're looking for more corridors that, that they could they could expand into. I know that there's a situation where ranchers can get compensated for losses from wolves, and so they can make a claim, oh, I lost this many animals or, or whatever. Um, but there's, I guess, some controversy around that. I was reading that the Western Watersheds Project uh, say that they found some errors and some oddities in the reporting, and two-thirds of the claims that they investigated from 2019. So is it, it sounds like it's possible that the predation from wolves is being exaggerated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's sort of a couple things going on there. There are several funds that are available for ranchers to get compensated. It's a pretty politically palatable thing to propose if you're, you know, if you're a representative in the, in the Southwest and you, you care about wolves, but maybe you don't want to do anything too controversial yet. Um, you may say, well, I'm going to get funding for, a, a ranching compensation fund and it sort of appeases everybody at once, um, which is good. I mean, it's not a bad thing. It's great. But just to say it's one of those things that there has been funding towards that. And I do think it's a good thing to keep getting funding towards. But there is a point where you kind of bring in the second reality that you're bringing up where you don't want to have that become sort of its own political tool um, against the wolves. It's really intended to be a political tool in support of the wolves. But um, Katrin County is where... Western Watersheds Project was focusing that inquiry, 
particularly. And the, it started out, the question was, why do wolves keep dying in Ketron County? Why is this a like sinkhole for wolf recovery when there's tons of habitat there and um, the Gila National Forest has long time been a great place to be, you know, releasing wolves. And it was, so they, they had FOIA, they had sent in a Freedom of Information Act request for all of the reports of the cattle um, that has been preyed on by Mexican gray wolves just to see if they could find some patterns in like, why were those cattle eaten over maybe other cattle or what was going on? And it was in looking at those reports that they suddenly started to realize some very serious questions of, um, you know, why, like some of the photos didn't quite meet the descriptions of, what the carcass looked like when they found it. And um, there were several other inconsistencies that just brought up a lot of questions. And again, it's like Katrin County is an area where there's been a very high level of predation on cattle. And the question is why? And then also, is it, is that actually what's going on? Um, and there's still not a lot of answers. We, we talked to Fish and Wildlife Service a lot about this a lot. They seem genuinely, concerned that there may be other things going on um, with why are these cattle dying or, but anyway, uh, I, th I think there is most definitely some political motivation happening in that area. Um, and also this has been going on for quite a while. I think that, that also we, as I was saying before, you've got wolves on top of cattle and it's just time for us to, uh, make sure that that's that we're not counting on those wolves to survive the population. You know, we we need to make sure that there's wolves in other places. So, if that doesn't happen, I mean, Fish and Wildlife Service basically just decimated the Prieto Pack, um, which was a uh, pack that's been around for years and has had um, has sired lots of very genetically valuable wolves and basically by from removal and um, trapping that pack was just basically wiped off of the landscape, which is not okay because we can't be losing. Those are important, not only important genetically wolves, but also to have a pack actually, you know, functioning as a pack um, is, a, is an important part to the whole population. We can't, we can't be having that happen. So I think more than anything, it's motivation to make sure that, yeah, we're not counting on, on one area to not putting all of our eggs in one basket, if you will. In a state of shock after the war. We interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... That was a very recent story that uh, about that pack, that particular pack you just mentioned. Could you give a summary of that, like where that pack came from and, and what its numbers were and what ended up just happening recently? The Prieto pack has had ongoing issues with... Um, in this area, Rainy Mesa and in um, near the Gila. And one of the things that happens when you start interrupting a pack, like one of the wolves was trapped by, um, by a rancher, which they're allowed to do if they think that it may stop the predation from happening. And then there was another one that was an illegal trapping. Basically a couple, you know, within the last few years, there's been several moments where one of the wolves has something happen and wolves are such social species they're so tied together in these pack structures that when you when you interrupt it by having one you know pulled out by a trap or removed from the wild and put into captivity because the agency sees it as a problem one it takes a while for that pack to reestablish some kind of, you know, uh, social structure that will keep it safe and keep it productive. And what we've been seeing happen is that that particular, the Prieto pack, 
kept having these incidences happen one after another. And so it's almost like the pack wasn't able to move to a place where it could recover from the last removal. And so it kept just kind of hovering around in these areas where then there was a lot of cattle and then it would go to the cattle. I mean, it was just kind of one of those things that just kept getting worse and worse. And then um, it's been in the last few months that the, the alpha female was removed um, as well as one of the juveniles, another juvenile just like took off, which they do start to do. They'll wander to look for um, another, for a mate. Um, basically it was just kind of like the final tipping point. Um, and it was just in this last report, we get monthly reports to the public. It was just in this last report that the Fish and Wildlife Service said that the Prieto pack was no longer considered a pack. And that was really devastating to a lot of advocates and also one of the juveniles that was killed by the agency removed and, and essentially ki- and was eventually killed by the agency was um, a wolf that we, so we put together this pup naming contest we do every year. Um, and we have kids from all over the country submit names and little essays and drawings. And it's a really awesome way to be able to engage with kids on the species and get them excited about the recovery effort. And one of the winners in January had named that that particular wolf. And, you know, I it's always a little bit of a risk with this kind of a program because the possibility of a kid's wolf dying naturally is, you know, we, we wait a year because it's that first year that's so hard for the pups to survive. But, you know, the likelihood that they might die naturally with early is, is possible. Um, But God, I just, the thought of having to tell parents like, hey, in case you see it in the news, we want to make sure, you know, you're ready. Uh, The pup that your, your child named um, is, has been removed or has been killed. And um, it's, it's a real quandary for me because I want kids to learn about wolves and learn about natural processes, including death and including, you know, renewal. And, um, and yet, um, when you, when you have to explain that, it's really, it's, um, yeah, it's not, it's not the best way to maybe yeah. be advocating for wolves, but anyway, so that's part but, of Well, that's a heartbreaking story, honestly. Yeah. And, and that kid has um, been really involved in, uh, Lobo advocacy for a while and kind of, he understands, but also like he was, he was really excited about winning, uh, winning the contest. Um, with, yeah. So anyway, uh, that was sort of some things that have come up recently about Prieto pack. Uh, it's, it, it's been a very compelling group of wolves to, to watch. And, um, I think a lot of the people I work with have been pretty, pretty devastated by that loss that came right as the coronavirus was keeping people inside and things were starting to shut down. And I think it's been a hard thing for a lot of people who advocate for wolves um, to feel like, you know, there was not an opportunity to get a more public inquiry into why did, why did that have to happen? As I'm sure that you've noticed the, pandemic has been they've uh, the feds especially have been using that as cover for pushing through all sorts of anti-environmental things right now yeah yeah that's true yeah it's yep. been a bit devastating to watch mm-hmm. yeah and so th- it seems like there's a lot of different entities that are involved here in the whole situation when it comes to trying to to recover them like like there's you know, activists, and nonprofits, you know, and then and then these different agencies at the federal level and then also at the state level, too. Yes, that's right. Um, the state game and fish, both in New Mexico and Arizona, are very involved in the program, in the recovery program. So you've got those agencies, which um, Arizona's is sort of notoriously not very environmentally focused at all. In fact, they have a pretty bad track record. Um, New Mexico's is kind of very, uh, follows the politics of New Mexico, which um, kind of zigzags in and out of (laughs) liberal and conservative uh, movement building, I think, um, much, much more 
erratically, I would almost say, than maybe Arizona, which has been kind of on a <laughs> slow trajectory back to more of a liberal political reality, but still is, is quite has a lot of conservative um, electoral presence. Um, and so, yeah, we work a lot with the different state entities or, or putting pressure on them, um, as well as the federal agencies. And then also we are in touch with some of the advocates and um, agency people in Mexico as well. There's about probably about 30 wild wolves still in um, Chihuahua and Durango. And there's several uh, facilities in Mexico still trying to keep uh, wolves bred there. There was uh, several that were brought from the U.S. down to the facilities in Mexico. And so we do have we do work with um, people there to continue to, you know, keep that, that part of the population alive. Um, sometimes, well, Fish and Wildlife Service can technically count that population as part of the recovery effort. We've felt like that, 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 that shouldn't really count towards the U.S. effort because of the barrier of the, um, the border. And, you know, the border wall is a more tangible walk, but honestly, border militarization has impacted the possibility of species going back and forth, or um, the population going back and forth over the border for quite a while. Um, there's, it's, it's not, it's not a, it's not an area that you're going to see wolves being able to migrate through very easily anyway. Um, but, but also with the militarization, it's been difficult. And now with the wall, it's basically impossible. So w our position is, we want to continue to support Mexico in bringing the species back, however they see as best, um, but not be relying on that to be a part of what we might be able to do here um, because of the that barrier right now. Um, so we, we do stay in touch with them, and then um, and then as I said, the White Mountain Apache Tribe also um, is a is is a partner with the recovery. Um, they have a pretty small staff that that does do um yeah some work to make sure that the wolves that are traveling there's a couple packs on the reservation um that people know you know what to look for and um they are not collared there so it's a little bit less we, we don't know as many how many are on there but we know that there are several packs that are on the that reservation as well so we we stay in touch with you know, all the different entities involved and also the breeding facilities, um, which are such a critical part of the recovery effort. We're not in touch with all of them. Some of them really prefer to be, to kind of keep politically aside and stay more aligned with the, the agencies and um, keep those relationships good, which is fine. And then some other facilities choose to be more involved in the advocacy because they see it as really important to the success of their their breeding efforts and their um, their captive efforts. We work a lot with a group in, in, in New York, the Wolf Conservation Center, um, and the Endangered Species. Yeah, we work with several of the different breeding areas, and then we try to just stay in touch with as many as possible. Um, and let them know kind of what we're putting out there as outreach um, and try to also learn what are they doing in their facilities to talk about Mexican gray wolves so that we can kind of be in step with that, knowing that they're really doing an amazing service to make sure that the public even knows about Mexican gray wolves, you know, when they go to a zoo in St. Louis or in Chicago or whatever, um, that those people can also become advocates even if they don't live in the Southwest. So, right. yeah. Because in the in the wild here on the U.S. side of the border, is it the the, the number is um, it's less than 120 wolves altogether? Um, it's a, it's over 160 now oh. with this recent population, um, and that's actually probably a pretty conservative. That's a conservative estimate because um, they do a population count once a year and they try to collar as many as they can, and they're counting you know from what they they'll find the collared one. And then if that one is traveling with a pack, um, they'll try to count that whole pack. So it's a pretty, it's a good count, but it's not an accurate, it's not an exact count. And so they do put that number out as at least this number. Yeah. So, and, and 
to give credit where it's due, like it, it's grown in the last three years, much, it's grown more than it has in the past. And that population number is great. It's something to celebrate. I mean, there's, it is, um, it takes a lot of coordination to pull this off. And, you know, in that sense, they are doing a great service. And also we just keep reminding people, um, even with that good news, we have to keep in mind that, that it's not actually fixing the genetics to have that population growing without also the genetic uh, kinship diversifying as well. Right, right. Because I, I did see, you know, when I was researching here, I did see that, you know, some people have considered this to be kind of a rough year so far with the number of wolves that have been found dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, um, I think there's been more wolves killed in the last year than than has happened in, I think I heard somebody say in the entire recovery process, that might not be exactly accurate, but it's definitely one of the highest years for sure of right. wolves that have died. Um, and, and that's a mix of agency, you know, capturing and killing wolves, which when they capture them, there is this reality that um, they're very likely to not survive that capturing. It's extremely traumatic for wolves to be removed from their pack. Um, and they often just, just don't, they just don't survive those, um, that removal. And even more than, you know, other animals that they, they have, they're known to really not do well in that process. And then ranchers trapping wolves when they find them has also been an issue. And then there has been, um, a couple of, uh, private trapping that has been, is under investigation trapping is not legal in arizona but it is legal in uh new mexico okay and even though it's a the the species is endangered it's legal to shoot or trap it under certain circumstances yeah i mean if the if they're threatening you or um you're not supposed to shoot them if they're threatening anything other than like a human life um but a lot of the times you know it's a pretty yeah, the a lot of people claim when they have shot wolves that they thought it was a coyote. So we do a lot of outreach around what is the difference between a coyote and a wolf, and how do you, how can you easily tell the difference? And I get it. I mean, they are large, dog-looking animals. But honestly, every time I look at images of the two, you know, in the wild next to each other, I don't know. I mean, a wolf is pretty distinguishable, I think. Um, and many of the wolves that are wild in this area have collars on. So, yeah, and, and they're often traveling together. It's pretty rare that you would see a dispersed wolf. So it's just it's kind of one of those things that feels hard to believe when that happens. Yeah. Yeah. When I when I first came to this area two years ago, I went camping um, at this time of year, actually. And so this was 2018. And I went, I ended up um, over in eastern Arizona in the valley of the Blue River. Mm. Uh, and it's, it's really beautiful, of course, you know, uh, coming south out of Alpine there, right? Yeah. And so I went down there and I stopped at one of the, it was like a trailhead or something, I think. And there was a sign there from the Forest Service talking about the introduction of the Mexican gray wolves. And there was a list down there of like, here's what you should do, you know, like, and then of course someone had come through and vandalized the sign, turning everything into its opposite. So it was suggesting killing the wolves, you know, mm. right? So I, I saw that and I remember driving back to this area from there afterwards on the 180, I saw a big billboard, you know, on somebody's private land that was anti-wolf too. And so I feel like, I feel like that's probably a minority, just a, but a rather vocal minority. But there's also, it just represents like a, a, a cultural hurdle here. Yeah, it's that, that presence of anti-wolf sentiment. It's very strong. And even if when we talk to people and, you know, in the do polling or talk to people when we're out in, in uh, at events and hear overwhelming excitement about wolves um i think people here 
that wolves are interrupting somebody's livelihood and particularly when they hear that they're interrupting the livelihood of industry that's been here for so long, like the livestock producers, um, there quickly is a shift of empathy towards that, which I understand, but I think it's a real sharp turn away from wolves pretty quickly. Yeah, we have done a lot of, I mean, several of the groups that we work with have coexistence programs where they're supporting livestock producers to go out and get more range riders there's lots of um, non-lethal ways that people can be keeping wolves away from cattle with um, with different techniques that that have been tested around the country and used here and if, you know they're often not effective forever because the, these wolves are pretty smart but they they are effective and so there are groups defenders of wildlife is one of them there's there's several other groups that do a lot of effort to to do some more coexistence and i think that's a good way to remind people that it's not you, you don't have to have one thing or the other i mean it'd be great if there was the possibility that wolves could kind of trump cattle in some of these places but i think really what needs to happen is there needs to be both the advocacy for the wolves to be this high priority and also there needs to be efforts to support coexistence strategies because we're not going to get rid of the cattle, at least not in the short term. And the, the situation is just so precarious with wolf recovery that we kind of have to have all angles covered um, at this point. So, yeah. And we do work a lot with attorneys and um, right now there's an opportunity to really have an influence on the future of Mexican gray wolves, the under that 10J rule that I mentioned, the agency has to have um, a, a plan for how to manage the wolf. You know, if they're going to get this flexibility, they have to have plans in place for how do they recover, how do they follow the Endangered Species Act, and they put out a rule which had a list of all of the management protocol and, and policies in um, 2015 and it was it was pretty bad it was it was not an effective response and so groups got together and they filed a lawsuit and we um, got a very good ruling back from the district court saying that in, in fact the Fish and Wildlife Service had rejected the science and had done a really poor job of reflecting what scientists were saying about lobo recovery and and told the agency they had to go back and redo that rule. And so right now we have an opportunity to influence that process. Um, they have a NEPA process that they're going through, the National Environmental Policy Act, which says that the, the agencies have to turn back to the public and ask for input. And so um, you know, we're talking here on June 2nd, we have another two weeks in this first stage of the process. And there are public comments that are um, being asked for from Fish and Wildlife Service, and you can find out how to submit comments at mexicanwolves.org. That is just the first step. We're going to have hopefully public meetings in um, the coming year as they move forward with reviewing that in, that initial input and um, present a new rule and a new set of policies, and then we'll have another opportunity to to comment on those. So we're really encouraging people to get involved now because this is a, this is a very, this is a really good opportunity to have a pretty sizable um, impact on the future of the management of the, the wolves. Um, yeah. Right. Well, that seems like a good segue to talk about in general. How is it that, uh, or other ways that people can help out with the campaign? So right now there is this public comment period. You can go on to mexicanwolves.org and you can find out how to get involved in that process, which you know will be the next couple of years and is a great time to get involved. And we also have pactivists throughout the United States, uh, the Southwest. Um, we have a pactivist group in Phoenix. We have one in Albuquerque, Santa Fe, um, Flagstaff, Tucson. We have several groups and they each have a pack leader and those groups do amazing job getting out into the communities and going to events and tabling 
and I work with them to, to come up with the materials that they want on their tables. And it's a really great way to, to just locally be able to respond to the different ways that people are excited and interested in Lobo recovery. And the, yeah, so if people want to get involved with one of the Pactivist groups, they can um, get in touch with me, uh, Amy, at MexicanWolves.org, or there's information on our website about how to do that. And then the other plug I would put in is the pup naming contest. We work with a bunch of different schools around the country, but particularly in the Southwest, to use curriculum that we've we've put together in the classroom. Um, and we have different um, grade levels for the contest. So if you're teaching younger kids, um, we have stuff for that as all the way up until eighth grade. And um, we have found this is like a really fun way to get kids involved, but also their parents involved. And we can choose about, we name about 30, 25 to 30 uh, wolves a year, get, get a collar and, um, and then we have a number for them. And rather than referring to them by that number, we refer to them by the name that the kids give them. And we try to do some local media around the, the naming of the pups and just basically elevate, you know, that moment of excitement that this is another animal that the public can connect to and, and follow the story of that, of that wolf. Um, and so we're always looking for volunteers to go into the schools and present in the classrooms. A lot of teachers take us up on that offer to send a volunteer in and give a quick presentation on wolves and Every time I've done it, there's always one kid that's just so into wolves and they can't believe that there are people who go around and get to just like talk about wolves all the time. And that is like my absolute favorite moment with this work is just getting to see those kids light up because I, while I get so discouraged thinking about, you know, what you were just talking about in terms of how, you know, you go out into areas where there are wolves and there's all this evidence of people really actively trying to prevent it all you have to do is go hang out with a bunch of kids that are wolf crazy and so excited about it and you're like oh this this is gonna be all right we're gonna we just gotta we just gotta focus on these guys and make sure that they that that excitement you know keeps getting nurtured because they have normalized that wolves are here you know they're they're like very accepting and even excited and um, so that's a hopeful place, and it's a fun way to get involved, too. Um, we have a little website, pupnamingcontest.org. You can kind of see some of the material that we use in the classroom and encourage parents to use at home. Um, and, yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a great way to get involved. Um, and, yeah, we have other opportunities right now. It's pretty tough. Like all organizers, it's just you, didn't, you don't really think about how much you rely on community events, even as we're such a digital social media world. And we have always had a huge social media presence. We have a Facebook page with, um, you know, over a million followers that we, we keep people engaged, but, um, it's, it's, it's tough not being able to get out and actually talk to people. So hopefully we'll get to do that soon as well. That's great. I'm really excited to hear about all that and all those resources you mentioned. We'll list all those in the in the show notes um, that go with this, so you can email me anything you want me to include as a link, and I'll do that. And uh, you know, so if someone from New York City just wanted to write you a big check, they could do that too, right? Oh, sure, of course, yes. There are. There's a link to donate on our on the MexicanWolves.org, um, and yes, we would be very appreciative of any kind of financial support. Um, the nice thing about our project is. We're pretty, we really are in service of a lot of different groups who all are, you know, kind of bringing their piece to the whole, to the whole effort. Um, and maybe just, you know, the idea of managing social media presence and or a website that kind of brings everybody together. Um, it, it's a, it's a simple and efficient way to really highlight how many people are working on this and it's been it's a it's great it's a really good effort and um yeah i i definitely support um advocating for people to to keep us going <laughs> <laughs> is there anything else you want to throw out there here at the end i will encourage um people to get involved um in this comment period 
and particularly ongoing throughout this process, I, I truly believe we're in a moment where this could be the next chapter of, of this story and, um, and one that, that makes sure Mexican gray wolves are here for the, the future generations. So yeah, get involved now. Thank you. And thanks so much. This has been super fun to talk to you about this. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.